Hi, my name is Jordan Wilson. Today we're going to look at individual assets as investments versus investing in funds. Now we started this journey by taking a look at investor profiles. That's your financial situation, your prospects, your investment objectives, constraints you might have, risk tolerance. And as I mentioned many times, your investor profile drives your target asset allocation. What sort of the mix of assets you want to best achieve your goals. And within target asset allocation, one of the things we considered was diversification and asset correlations. So now that we're looking at how to build a portfolio, we want to factor those aspects in your investment objectives, asset correlations, diversification. And as we'll see later, we want to do things on a cost effective basis because cost when we looked at compound returns, we saw how even slight erosion, half a percent, one percent in return, has a huge impact over time on growing your wealth. So today we're gonna to look at just a quick overview of individual assets versus investment funds. And that's just simply our objectives, straightforward pros and cons of individual assets versus what are the different types of investment funds and the pros and cons. Individual assets. Basically, you build your own portfolio from the ground up. You decide what assets you want to own. You analyze different investments. You add to your portfolio or subtract over time as one stock or asset becomes better value or seems like the better investment over things that you might own currently. The beauty of investing in individual assets is that you only own assets that you want. If I look at the NASDAQ 100 or the TSX 60 or the TSX 300. There's probably 10, 12, 15 stocks in there that are just dogs I don't want to own. If I can pick and choose my individual assets for my portfolio, I can avoid those 15 stocks on the NASDAQ 100, which are not good investments. And because of that, I should be able to outperform the NASDAQ 100 with my own NASDAQ best 85. So in theory, investing in individual assets creates that best of breed concept. And because of that, you should be able to outperform whatever benchmark you're looking at. If it's a TSX 300, maybe I discount 50 of those stocks and invest in the other 250 should be able to outperform the benchmark. Building your own is great for tactical investing or market timing. Market timing might be hmm, interest rates have been running about 5%, say, but all indications are that interest rates are going to fall. And by loading up on longer term duration bonds, I can take advantage of declining interest rates in my portfolio. Conversely, if I expect interest rates to rise, I may want to shorten my duration of my bonds. And that provides some protection, some uh, hedging maybe against rising in, uh, interest rates. Again, on the tactical side, maybe the prospects in Australia 
look fantastic versus North America. So I want to lower my exposure to Canada and the United States and focus my investing in Australia where the times are good. So that's kind of market timing, tactical investing. It is doable. Now, when we looked at asset correlations and diversifications, we saw that Investopedia talked about holding a wide range of assets. And I mean, one of their ballparks was kind of 25 to 30 stocks. Now, Investopedia also has another article posted currently that says, well, actually, it's more like 60 and even that's not enough. But 30, 60, we'll say that's doable. Add in another 15 to 20 bonds to give you some bond diversification. And maybe, you know, all you can need is 50 to 75 individual assets to get by. So it is doable. Or is it really doable? And that's kind of the question to ask yourself. When we looked at diversification and asset correlations, we saw that it's very, very important to diversify across different asset classes. The two examples I cite here, currently we see that there's a negative 0.32 correlation coefficient between the S&P 500 stocks and US 20 plus year bonds. And we saw that negative correlations provide excellent diversification to reduce the risk of your portfolio when you combine those two assets. We also look here, there's a 0.57 correlation between S&P 500 stocks and commodities. Not quite negative, but even at 0.57, that provides some eh, decent diversification impact to your portfolio. Within it, an asset class, we saw wildly different risk return profiles, and we also see some differing asset correlations. Standard and poor 500 stocks versus or combined with uh, emerging market stocks, 0.81 correlation. Some positive diversification there. Although as we discussed with international equities, over time we've seen a growing correlation with North American equities because the world is shrinking. Everybody's operating globally. Starbucks, McDonald's, Walmart, which used to be US centric are now everywhere in the world. So we see that correlation growing in time. If we look at bonds and compare 20 plus year US bonds with US Treasury protected, so inflation, we see a 0.5 correlation. Again, decent diversification. So if you're only going to invest in certain stocks, you probably want to look at different sizes, different geographies, different industries. Suddenly finding 25 to 30 equities to effectively diversify is a little bit more challenging. Another problem I think with individual assets <clears throat> is the hard cost. And I say here that you probably need a critical mass. And by what I mean there is if I have a hundred thousand dollars in my portfolio and I want to buy 50 plus investments, and let's say the mix of my assets is 70% stock, 30% bonds. So if I want 30 stocks in that, 70,000, that's about $2,300 for each individual stock. The first problem you've got is 
that may take you out of the ability to buy certain companies. Google, for example, is trading at $2,100 today. Amazon, $3,350. So you may not even be able to buy one single share in some of these assets. Now, those are extremes, granted. But there's a lot of companies out there. Tesla, $850. Apple, $136. Lots of companies in the 200 range. So does it make a lot of sense to be able to buy, you know, like less than 10 shares? And how do you add to that over time? If you're depositing 300, 500, or thousand dollars per month, how do you split that out? Thousand dollars per month. Can you even buy some of these things? No. So how do you divvy up your future investments and your purchase stream trading costs to accumulate and divest those add up over time it's much easier to buy 500 shares of a company with an online brokerage fee of ten dollars than to spend that ten dollars to acquire you know one share every month because you've got to divide your assets up so many different ways if you're in a non-tax divert account there's potential taxes. Every time you divest, there's going to be capital gains, hopefully. And another hard cost is, can you actually pick the winners? So can you market time? Will your tactical investing pay off? Maybe, maybe not. And that's an issue we'll delve into in one of the future episodes. Can people pick winners? Opportunity cost, there's another issue. If I'm a school teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, a nurse, I worked a solid eight or nine or 10 hour day, do I have the time to come home at night and monitor 50 plus investments? And even if I have the time, do I have the desire? So that's a cost to you. And it's not just those 50. If I'm invested in a mining company, let's say Franco Nevada Mines, I've got to keep an eye on all the other mining companies because on a relative basis, Franco may not be the optimal investment that I want. So I've got to keep an eye on what's going on around me. I've got to pay attention to the systematic risks that may impact mining companies, the non-systematic risks. What's Franco Nevada doing with their management, their operations? Have they had any cave-ins, any environmental issues? It can take a lot of work to monitor current and prospective investments. So again, on a cost basis, uh, I think you need a critical mass to do individual investing. And I don't know what exactly that is. Let's say it's $2 million. But even then, I think many investors are better off not investing individually. Because at that level, you need to hire someone like me to monitor and make investment recommendations. And there's a cost involved with that as well. So uh, I like to minimize cost. And I think if you're trading individual assets, the trade-off of avoiding the bottom 15 NASDAQ companies uh, is eroded by all the other costs involved. On the other end of the spectrum, we've got investment funds. An investment fund is basically just a collective investment scheme. And by that, investors aggregate their money in a single investment vehicle. You take your $100,000 portfolio, you put it in a fund, and a investment professional takes the 100,000 from 1,000 other people, and you have that critical mass to adequately diversify 
And uh, if it's an actively managed fund, you do have investment professionals that do the monitoring and the buying and selling. So that can add value. And what you'll find is it's a very simple way to create a well diversified investment portfolio. You get better portfolio diversification because you have the money to invest in different asset classes, subclasses across time. If it's a fixed income, so short, medium or long term bonds, different sizes, capitalization of stocks, small, medium and large cap funds, emerging market, developed nations, frontier uh, stocks. So you have the ability as you aggregate everyone's money to get into some very useful diversification. It also may acts, allow investors access to investments they can't afford on their own. And I mentioned that with say Amazon shares, if they're costing, you know, 33, $3,500 per share, then by aggregating everyone's money, the fund itself can buy a decent amount that you may not be able to do on your own. You tend to find investment funds have improved liquidity over doing things by yourself. Now you can easily flip your shares on a stock exchange quite quickly if they're a larger cap and there's more shares outstanding. But often what you'll find with investment funds is that you can buy or sell your entire portfolio, you know, in the space of the same day or overnight. So again, a simple way to get improved liquidity. And then because you've grouped your resources, you've got some economies of scale on cost. Some fixed income vehicles provide better rates of return, the more asset size that you're investing in. And you see that often, you know, on a simple example with term deposits, you know, the smaller amounts receive less interest. So again, cost, liquidity, ability to properly diversify, that's kind of an advantage of the investment funds themselves. Now, what we have here is we've got closed end funds is one example of an investment fund. It's like a company. The closed end fund issues shares or units to sh investors. It's listed on a stock exchange and the shares are traded between investors. Now, like a company as well, yeah, you can issue more shares, but no, that's not a huge issue for the companies or the funds. So the share value, it's primarily going to be based on net asset value. If I have a portfolio that's invested in nothing but Amazon stock at $3,350 per share, and I've got 3350 shares outstanding of the closed end fund, then the net asset value is $1. Very easy calculation. What you do find with closed end funds is that they're subject to supply and demand, just like any common share. And maybe that is due to strong management. So if I've got a closed end fund and it's got an investment portfolio with a market value of a million dollars, short term liabilities of a million and 9 million shares outstanding, your NAV is going to be $11 per share. And that's the one component. But then we've got this premium or discount. And that's just simply based on the investor supply and demand. Investors who want that closed end fund, much as if they want Amazon or Tesla stock, they're going to bid up the price. And especially if it's a good mutual fund, because the owners 
won't be willing to sell. So that just again drives the demand and there's less supply out there. And that would be a premium. Now, if it's trading at a discount, the opposite would be true is that yeah, maybe the, you know, the management isn't that good. Maybe we're not thrilled about their investment strategy. So you have more people wanting to sell their close end shares or units, but there's not very many people willing to buy. So they've got to sell it for less than net asset value in order to make a trade. And that would be the discount. Now, the other end would be the open end mutual funds. Here, you actually buy or sell directly with a fund company. The fund company issues and redeems units. There's no trades on stock exchanges. Price is normally simply just the NAV because the fund company redeems and issues at the NAV. There really isn't any need for premiums or discounts. It used to be an issue on liquidity with an open end mutual fund, but that's not the case really anymore. The bigger funds all buy or sell on a daily basis. At the end of the day, they calculate the NAV for the fund and that's the price that you can buy or redeem at. And then the next day, the process repeats itself. Now, you might have some small liquidity issues if the markets all crash overnight. And if you had a closed fund, maybe you could bail out during the trading hours. Whereas with a standard mutual fund, you're stuck till the end of the day. And some smaller funds or some more exotic funds, they may still be less frequent than daily. It might be weekly. It might be bi-weekly. You see that at times with hedge funds. So there could be liquidity issues with a open end mutual fund. The other point I'd make with these is at times you'll see an open end fund close. That does not mean that it turns into a closed end fund and then is traded on the stock exchange, etc. It just means that usually the fund has reached a certain size where they're not going to issue new units to investors. And often that happens when a fund just gets too big. So if I've got a mutual fund that invests in junior mining companies, you know, the mom and pop shops that have very limited capitalization themselves. And let's say my fund was a hundred million dollars and I could go out and buy 20 different mining companies by investing 5 million in each of them that gives me some diversification within that industry not as an overall but if i end up suddenly at two billion dollars how can i go invest that into small cap mining companies i mean there's not that many of them especially good ones and in some countries you have limitations on what you can actually invest you know, maybe it's a maximum of 5% of the company's issued capital that you can purchase. So there's issues that the bigger you are as a mutual fund, the less opportunities that are out there. So you might see a fund close to allow itself to remain relatively agile. And we'll look at this a little bit further later on in our series because this tends to be an issue with actively managed mutual funds is they're successful and because they're successful, they attract, attract more investors and more investor capital. And then one day they wake up and they've basically just become the market. They, they have no ability to buy and sell interesting investments because they're just too big. So if I've got a $2 billion fund and I'm trying to find, you know, five or $10 million investments in small companies that'll provide a nice return, that investment could return me a hundred percent, but what's the big deal from 5 million to 10 million or 10 million to 20 million in growth 
when I've got a $2 billion fund. That's significant when my mutual fund's 100 million, de minimis when my fund is 2 billion. And that's sort of also an issue when we talked about companies. When Apple came out with its iPods, that had a big impact on the company. If they came out with the iPod today, given its huge increase in value since those days, what's the impact on the bottom line of the iPods? A lot less than it was when they came out in the first place. Exchange traded funds, ETFs, they're kind of like the close end funds. They listed on stock exchange, shares trade between investors. They usually trade at net asset value, but that's not guaranteed because again, supply and demand may create small uh, premiums or discounts. It used to be that many all ETFs were passive index funds. And that just meant that uh, they replicated say the TSX 300, the Dow Jones 30, the S&P 500, NASDAQ 100. But over time, you're seeing more exotic ETFs. You're seeing some actively managed. You're seeing some inverse, which would be sort of betting on bear markets, maybe some multipliers where they use leverage to increase their returns by two or three times, these sort of things. And then the final category, hedge funds which we probably won't get into at all in this series, but just to finish that investment fund side. So hedge funds are basically just pooled structures of investments, use a variety of strategies to achieve their goals, just like the other funds. The difference tends to be the level of regulation involved. Hedge funds are usually set up for more sophisticated investors and sophistication often correlates between investor experience and knowledge and their asset size and for some reason there tends to be this expectation that the more money you have the more sophisticated or knowledgeable you are and that doesn't always hold true but that's the way it works Hedge funds often use tactics not allowed in mutual funds. A lot of long, short derivative type trading, again, more, more advanced and uh, let's call it interesting investment strategies. I think we saw that in the last week with GameStop where you had the short sellers trying to drive uh, GameStop into bankruptcy. Those were hedge funds for the most part. Buy-in is often quite high. They want bigger investors who are gonna keep their money in the fund and you don't want people that are gonna buy and then one month later want their money out. Uh, the other big differentiating factor is that the annual fees, costs and management fees are usually very high in hedge funds. What you often see with a hedge fund is performance fees. And that means that, let's say we have an equity fund and our benchmark is tied to the S&P 500. That would be the hurdle rate, the performance of the S&P 500 or the S&P 500 plus 1% or 2% something that's been agreed upon. Any performance by the fund in excess of this agreed upon hurdle rate may be split 50-50 between investors and the fund managers. So the better that the fund does, the better that the managers do as well. And while the upside split tends to be yeah, common in a lot of hedge funds. You probably will never find a hedge fund that will refund management fees when they underperform their hurdle rates. So 
that's just a quick overview comparing sort of eh, some of the minor major pros and cons of investing in individual assets or investment funds. I'm not a huge fan unless you have a critical mass of individual assets just because diversification is difficult and costs can run up quickly. Plus, I see a lot of uh, individual clients that, you know, they've got a portfolio on an Excel spreadsheet and it's got like 60 different stocks in it. And you're going, oh, do you really have the time or the interest to monitor these? And so that's, you know, to me, another problem, not a cost problem, but just effective use of your time. So going forward, I'm going to concentrate on open end mutual funds. We'll look at what they are, what some of the advantages of using them are, what some of the disadvantages are. And then we'll also look at the exchange traded funds, which are similar in certain contexts to the mutual funds, but there's also some distinct differences. And I think those are probably the two best vehicles for most investors to develop that foundation. And then once you've got that portfolio base built, then you can start adding uh, individual assets to that. And that might be market timing, that might be tactical investing. Or even if you don't add individual assets, you can add more exotic or alternate asset class funds too. Because if you look at funds out there, they come in every flavor. It used to be the plain vanilla index funds, but now you can get a fund in pretty much every combination you might want. So we'll look again starting next time at mutual funds, and then we'll delve into the differences in exchange traded. Thanks for listening and have yourself a good day.